honored. We're also going to dedicate some new altar wares, so the next Sunday will be a full Sunday for sure. Um, everyone is invited and to compliments the uh, high school and college graduates and new members. They, they get to for free, for free. The rest of you have to pay $5, which is not a bad price for a good lunch. So is there any, is there any insert in, in the bulletin this week? Okay. Well, I had a sh Okay, last night I had a shock. I still don't know. Where's Jordan? Where's Jordan? Where? Okay, how much electricity do we have? What? What? Daniel, tell me the truth. He won't. He's just crazy. Is is the entire <laughs> education building got edu uh, electricity? Yeah, but the, the, the church is back on. Yeah. They completed their work. They left some wire in the office. Oh, okay. Uh, last night I came in and the, I saw the light little dimmer thing was on, and then the alarm was on, so I knew we had power somewhere. Okay. Yeah, we're worshiping here because we don't have a sound system. And it's going to be a while before the sound system is completed. So be patient. Listen, we've got the greatest facility in the world to worship in. That is just a simple, wonderful fact. I think those are all the announcements. I don't know anything about any whole session. Make an announcement. Oh, Dennis. I'm so, Danny. Yes, he is. His hope is to come home today, maybe tomorrow. I'll be seeing him after worship. Um, so, I, I really hope that will be the case. Jake Nance is still a Presbyterian. I'll be seeing him this afternoon. So, his surgery was really needed, and he did extremely well. Okay, Katie, we have any other announcements? Council will remember just briefly. Folks, I'm just going to greet you now. Hi. And, but I'm not going to go out that way. Just come back, Council, and we'll just meet for just a couple minutes, okay? All right. Now, I want you to turn in your bulletin to the first song. It's called Lord Be Glorified. Okay? Jana, if you'll run it through one time. We'll sing a verse or two.
who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgive the iniquity of my sins. Please go to the Lord in silence as we make personal confession. Father, I thank you for hearing our confession. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Most merciful God, you have given your only Son to die for us and his us, and for his sake, grant us remission, forgiveness of all our sins. By your Holy Spirit, increase in us the knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to you, so that by your grace we may come to the last in life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive the Lord's forgiveness. In the name of Jesus, who died for you and rose again, and made forgiveness by his, by his power, your faith, and his grace. Receive his forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you inspired the scriptures that we might learn from you. Jesus, the Son of God, and the person of the Holy Spirit, direct our thoughts and hearts as today we journey to the book of Acts. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. reading is from the book of Acts, the first chapter. In the first book, the gospel according to St. Luke, O Theolithius, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Here is the reading. The second reading comes from the book of John, the 14th chapter. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world can't receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and you will, you will be in you. Here ends the reading. Would you please rise? The Holy Gospel for this seventh Sunday of Easter is recorded again in the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace, I live with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives you, I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father. 
for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go on from here. The Gospel of the Lord. Just as a, a little backup, in John 13, 14, and in 15, the 15 and 15 in particular, Jesus gives long discourses, basically preparing his disciples for the time when he wouldn't be with them, but assuring them that he would not leave them as orphans, that he would come, but he would come in a different way. And that is in the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And that is, we've been reading the book of Acts for the last 50 days. The purpose for doing that is to prepare us for Pentecost, which is the birth of the church. And so today, I ask you to go to your outline. The key theme is the expansion of the church in the world. The book of Acts is often called the book of the Holy Spirit or the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And it traces how the Christian church began. It's so important. The key verse is Acts 1.8. Our Lord Jesus is speaking, but you will receive power. Stop there. The word power comes from the Greek word dynamis, from which you get the word dynamite. Okay? Power. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The first section of Acts is pretty much based around the ministry of Peter, but chapters 1 through 12 are very specific about this. The place is in Jerusalem, and the primary area is certainly in Israel. Chapter 1, the promise of the Holy Spirit is given, Acts 1, 4, 5. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to await for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. So John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, have any of you ever told your children to do something, didn't give them a specific as to what's going to happen, you just told them to wait? Have you ever done that? You know what parents say? Lord, what do they say? Because I said, there you go, see, everyone knows that. Well, the disciples, um, you know, if your best friend is stupefied and rises again and tells you to wait, you wait. The ascension. The ascension takes place 40 days after Easter. Okay? Jesus means he was physically leaving, and that's why the person of the Holy Spirit had to come, so that you and I wouldn't be left orphans. So when they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons, that the Father is fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and stay in Salisbury, North Carolina, and in Rockwell and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, he went, and behold, two men stood by him in white clothes. And he said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go to heaven. So the promise is coming. 
And I see this on Facebook every day, literally. Things are so bad, people feel the Christ is going to come in on them. And they turn in the floor. We don't know. Jesus made that very clear. We need to be ready, whatever that is. Now, all of us know that Judas betrayed Jesus. Now, in John's Gospel that was read just a moment ago, he was called the ruler of this world. What John means by that is that Satan, the ruler of the evil part of this world, is coming, but he's using Judas to accomplish what he wanted to do. So, one of the men who had accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus being out and among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up for us. Stop there. The twelve disciples who had to take Judas' place, there was certain criteria. And that person, whoever it was, they had to have been with Jesus from basically the time of his baptism until the ascension. So basically, this person certainly knew Jesus. He's not counted among the original twelve, but he has been with them on the journey. Okay, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry. And apostles were from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell to Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now, do you remember that when Jesus was crucified, that the Roman soldiers uh, took his only, they wouldn't tear his only possession, which was his tunic or robe. And do you remember what the Roman soldiers did to decide which one of those soldiers would get the robe? That's right. They cast lots. This is not gambling. This is not gambling. Especially in the case of Matthias. The, the apostles felt sure was gambling with the, with the soldiers. But with the apostles, they felt strongly that using this method, God would reveal his will. And Matthias is ended. Just as a brief note, you never hear of Matthias after this. Now there are traditions about him, but you really don't have any biblical information about his ministry that he was certainly done. Now, when you get to Acts 2, you get to, to what we celebrate next Sunday, the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, there are two signs, symbols of the power of the Holy Spirit. He comes in a powerful wind, but it's not a destructive wind. There's a play called The Witnesses, and I still don't know how they did it. They did it with professional instruments, but they made a wind sound that was unreal. But the guy who was actually playing the part of Peter, who was sort of the moderator. He said the wind was in the house, but nothing nothing was needed. You could hear it, but it didn't destroy anything that gave life. Mm. Then tongues of fire appear over their head. So, if you go to the windows at Oregon, and you go to the Pentecost window, you will see some sort of symbol for wind, very obvious, and the Holy Spirit will be in red, but you'll also see flames. And that's why that is always done. Then Peter, remember the Peter, the denier and all that stuff? Well, this is Tom Corbell's theory. Jesus was there for 40 days with these guys and many other people. Don't you think he instructed them beyond words? And Peter's not the same man, I promise you, he is not. Because he preaches the first 
son on, on the day of Pentecost. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So they received his word, were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now, you're hearing me because I guess there's a speaker on the floor. Is that right? Is that helping with it? You're hearing me because I'm Mike. Can you imagine one person preaching a sermon who only spoke Aramaic, the everyday conversational language, but people from all over the world were in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, and many did not speak Aramaic. This is a one-time miracle in the Bible. You never see it before or after where the one who is speaking is understood by everybody else, but understood in their own language. That can only come by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's so important. In chapter 3, Peter is used, God uses Peter to heal a beggar. That man had, his legs had been shriveled all of his life. He was a beggar. And he begs Peter, to heal, to give him money. That's what he does for a living. He begs. And Peter looked at him and said, Silver and gold I have not, but what I have I will give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up. And he stood. And he and Peter proclaimed the Lord Jesus Christ. But Peter gets in trouble. So, we go to Acts 4. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing by them, they had nothing to say in opposition. I mean, these people have seen this guy for 38 years. He's as common as dirt. You saw him every day. Dead man. And now he's standing. You can't argue with that kind of truth. And when they commanded them to leave the council, they, excuse me, uh, they said nothing in opposition, but when they commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable, a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. But in order that it may not spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you, rather than to God, you must judge. But we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the, of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. <coughs> you see in bold camps the believers pray for boldness. Part of that boldness came about because their leaders prayed with boldness. And they did not back down, even though they were threatened, big time. The believers also in the early church, especially in the first few days and months of the church, had something that we don't understand. They had everything in common. And what that means is that people who had much gave to those who had very little. Everything was given. James was actually put in charge of the distribution. James apparently was a really good organizer. And so people went, did not go without the basic need for life. Now, we come to the first death of a Christian who is a lay person who lays down his life for Jesus Christ. Now, now the, 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 the Jewish authorities had heard Stephen. Stephen had been appointed to serve uh, so the apostles could continue to preach and not worry about setting up tables or doing sort of the day-to-day -day stuff. They needed to teach and to preach and to pray. So Stephen is 
is, is voting to become one of these people who, who serves. But he has a will like you can't believe and the knowledge of God. Now, he, he told these Jewish authorities the whole history of the Jewish history, of, 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 of their, their time from starting with Adam and coming all the way to the present day. You have to read it. It's amazing. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged. Who's he to tell us what to do? And they ground their teeth in him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gave him to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I've got to stop. He's standing at the right hand of God. Every time you say the creed, what is Jesus doing at the right hand of God? He's sitting, that's right. This is the only instance in all the Bible when we see Jesus standing at the right hand of God, let me continue. And he said, now this is Stephen talking, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man, got to stop, Son of Man is a title of Jesus, it's based in Daniel chapter 7, where one like a Son of Man appears, it's a judge judgment seat, and part of the uh, function of the Messiah, the Christ, is to judge. Okay? We will all have to face him. So, the Son of Man, which is a title that is repeated some 88 times in the Gospels alone for Jesus, a title for Jesus. The Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, which is the euphemism that he died. Look at what Stephen did. They were crushing his skull, beating his body, breaking bones in his body with stones, rocks. He's given a vision of Jesus standing. And I said this during one of the Lincoln services, I think. Uh, I've told many people this. I believe that Jesus will stand and extend his hand when you die, when you die in faith, he extended his hand to Stephen and welcomed him into heaven. It's a beautiful, beautiful image. Um, the story, chapters 1 through 7, tell the story of Peter and the Jews. Peter was a good Jew. He had a really hard time, though, because uh, some of the Jewish customs, like not eating unclean food, uh, were just driven into his soul. I mean, we've been taught that since the day he was born. Uh, God gives him a vision, and he sees his sheep come down, and there are all kinds of animals on it, clean and unclean. So there was a pig on it, at least. And God told, tells him, I can't eat that, Lord! It's unclean! And God says, don't ever say that. Don't say what I have made to be unclean. Mm. Okay. In chapter 8, it tells the story of Peter and the Samaritans. Now remember, the Samaritans, the Jews looked at them as half-breeds. They were part Jews, but they were, they, they were Arab, they were and there had been conflict going on from the time of Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament. So it had been going on, in this case, for at least 500 years. Um, chapters 9 through 12 tells the story of Peter and the Gentiles and his arrest and deliverance. Peter gets the message. If, because the message is, that the unclean people that the Jews looked at were called Gentiles. If you weren't a Jew, you were unclean. Now, Peter's gotten the message from God. He's to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to all people, Jew, Greek, 
everybody, everybody, which includes us. Okay? Um, he's arrested, and the people are scared half to death, uh, knowing he'll be killed. Uh, God miraculously delivers him from the prison, and he comes back and he tells them the whole story. With chapter 9 comes the second person that the book of Acts highlights. The first is Peter, but now we get to Saul. Now, remember when Stephen was being stoned to death, there was a young man by the name of Saul standing by, and he was holding the robes of those who were hurling the rocks. He's a Pharisee. A Pharisee is an expert in the Jewish law. He calls himself a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a very strict one. And he was completely in favor of them killing Stephen. He approved of it completely because Stephen was following this Jesus whom they called the Christ. And they didn't believe he was the Christ at all. Okay? But then... Paul, he's a Pharisee, and his calling, my calling right now is to organ Lutheran church as your interim. Okay? That's my calling. His calling, his calling was to go kill what would be called Christians, or at least in prison and torture them. So Saul, he's still Saul of Tarsus. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that he found any belonging to the way. Stop here. The early Christians were called the followers of the way. They are not called Christians at this point. Where did they get that title from? Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. See? Okay, belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly the light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. Whom you are persecuted. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who are traveling with you stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And I will show you how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Now, when I finish this journey, I want you to remember how much he must suffer. It will make sense. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. A little detail. 
in Galatians, which Paul wrote, even he's later named from Saul to Paul, he says to the Galatian Christians, see the large letters I am writing? And he makes another comment. Do you remember in 2 Corinthians, he actually talks about having a thorn in the flesh? What was that? What is life? I'm not just going to exonerate her right now. It wasn't her. It, we don't know what it was. I wonder if it was when that blinding light hit him. Because we know he didn't write any of his letters. He had described to it. Because he, he couldn't see well enough. When I get to heaven, I'll find that. I, that was a, what, do you, what do you call that? A bunny trail? You say it in confirmation all the time. When you get off the subject. No, don't act like a monkey. She says that really keenly. <laughs> uh, like you're going down a, anyway, going down a rabbit hole. Well, I just did. Okay. All right. Saul proclaims Jesus in the synagogue. Now you look at that. If you think of the conversion, it is beyond description. A man who hated Jesus more than anything in this world now proclaims him. And, and the time frame is just a matter of basically days, maybe a few weeks at the most. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, so it happened right away. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, and just think about that. He went to the synagogue. He's a Jewish Pharisee. Teaches in the synagogue. Now he's going to go proclaim this Jesus of Nazareth. That takes faith and guts. I'm not saying what you just said. <laughs> For some days he was with the disciples of Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying he is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name, this name? And had he not come here for that purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, and it means the anointed one. It is a title for the Messiah. Jesus is his name. Christ is his title. Then were followers of Jesus, the followers of the way, given a new name. You need to know this. In Acts 11, it starts there. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. The Hellenists were Greeks. Okay, that's what that is. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. But when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So that title that we meet constantly didn't happen in the, in, in the first few months or even maybe even the first couple of years. But they are then called Christians. Now, the ministry of Paul is chapters 13 through 38. I want to give you an assignment. I'm going to give you a test when you come next week. When I smile like that, you know I'm here. But I, I'm really sincere about this. I really wish 
and pray that you would seriously consider this week spending some time in God's Word reading nothing but the book of Acts. Just read the book of Acts. And, you know, you've got an outline. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a very small outline. But you will be amazed. You will be inspired. Okay. The first missionary journey. Now, there's no way to take you through all this stuff. Go to the map. You see the map. You see the first, I'm going to have to go back to that last page, but do you see the first missionary journey? The blue map. And then if you flip it, you'll see the second and the third. Now, I want to say something. Okay, I need someone to tell me what. I can look at the clock. Okay. I'm, I want to try to be faithful to time. Okay. I want to briefly, while you're looking at, at the fourth journey, okay, most people, you won't find the fourth journey called the fourth journey in the Bible. It is basically called the journey to Rome, and there's really no difference. The one detail, and scholars differ on this, we know that Paul wanted to take the gospel up as far as Spain. That's a long way. That's way north of, of Rome. Did he make it? There are, there are early Christian churches that formed about the time when Paul would have been a very old man by this time. Did he make it up there or did other disciples take the word? We don't know. But the fourth journey which involves a shipwreck, which involves a winter in a very undesirable port. Uh, the, the ship, Paul told them, don't go. Don't go to that particular port that the captain wanted to go to. But they wouldn't pay attention. Any of your parents got kids that don't pay attention to you? Well, do you think maybe parents might be a little smarter? Well, Paul was a whole lot smarter, but, you know, ego always gets in the way of learning. So he didn't do it. And the suffering that took place and the destruction of the ship. But Paul gives them a spanking. He said, if you listen to me the first time, this, we would not be doing this thing. No one's going to be hurt, but the ship will be gone. But then Paul... He's a Roman citizen. There isn't time to go into all these details. Roman citizen, they wanted to kill him, but they didn't have the authority to kill him because he told them that he was a Roman citizen. As a Roman citizen, he had a right to go before um, a Roman judge, in this case, in Rome. He is in prison for two years in Rome. Ann and I are doing a, um, a Zoom Bible study uh, with a group from Spirit of Joy Lutheran Church. And we just, how many of y'all have read any of Max Lucado? Max Lucado. Well, you, sh you should go online and check it out. Uh, just the book itself ought to make you want to run out and get it so you could learn. The book is called Anxious for Nothing. Can you imagine? It's basically a study of the book of Philippians that Paul wrote. It's amazing. But he talks a lot about his imprisonment time and how in the midst of being chained to a Roman guard was basically, I mean, you and I, I went to bed to Parson, I got a three-inch foam topper I put on top of that thing because the mattress was hard. I'm just so spoiled rotten. He slept in a cell. So we don't have any understanding of what people do. Okay, I, the, all these numbers that are on here are taking you to the places that Paul went in those particular journeys. This is what I'm recommending. 
That's why I want you to read the book of Acts. Because there's no way for me to do this here. I'll, you will see each city in the order if you will simply look in your Bible. And these maps will give you a key to that, a, a really good key to that. So that's a gift. And this is a gift to you. Please take advantage of the gift. Now, uh, so I want to go back now. Go back to your notes. Okay, it's right next to the first blue map. And do you see number two, the ministry of Paul, chapters 13 to 38? Can all of you see that? I need all of you with me in this one. Okay, is everybody there? It's test time. No, not really. But I want you with me. City of Jerusalem. In chapter 15 of Acts, you have the Jerusalem conference. That's a big deal. Now, let me read it to you. Council of Jerusalem or Apostolic Conference is a name applied by historians and theologians to a Christian Apostolic Age Council that was held in Jerusalem and dated around the year 50 AD. The council decided that Gentile converts to Christianity were not obligated to keep most of the law of Moses, including the rules concerning circumcision of males. The council did, however, retain the prohibition on eating blood meat containing blood and meat of animals not properly slain or on fornication and idolatry. Um, that conference came together. Remember the Gentiles is they're, they're the, the field for missionary work. And Peter initially wanted to make the Gentiles do all the, the Jewish obligations. And if you were a man, that would be circumcised. They basically, in this conference, decided what was important and what was not. But it's, it's, it's the first conference recorded in the Bible that deals with those kinds of issues. And then I simply put down here, Paul, second, third, and then you notice where I put it on what, CBE, Paul's arrest and voyage to Rome. I didn't put fourth journey. So you won't find that word. Now, you can just put your notes down because you don't have what I have. Um, I want to share with you a couple of lessons from the life of Paul. Remember that Ananias is taking you back to the vision where Paul saw of Tarsus sees Jesus, and then God tells Ananias, the man who came, took him, brought him into his home, baptized him, and fed him, and all that kind of thing. I want to show him how much he has to suffer for me. Do you remember I told you that? Paul suffered greatly for Christ Jesus and the proclamation of the gospel. Regardless of the circumstances, we learn to be content. Second Corinthians chapter eleven verses twenty-two to thirty-two. Five, you can't even comprehend this, and certainly I can't. Five times I received from the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Do you remember that Jesus was flogged? by Pontius Pilate, and there were 39 lashes. Jesus was almost dead by the time the soldiers got through with him. And then he was crucified. Paul received a flogging, not once, but five times. Then, on top of that, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked at night. 
and a day I was adrift on the sea. So there he was in the sea alone for a day and a half. He won't give up. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sweetless night and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. Now, none of us can comprehend what he suffered for you and me and Jesus. But I want to go back to the form in the flesh which apparently bothered him more than all the stuff I just shared with you. Second Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 10. So to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I want to end with the Philippian 4 text. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let the reasonable, reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes all human understanding will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Father, in a very brief time, we have journeyed through Luke's account of the early church as recorded in the book of Acts. We thank you for this precious time. Help us to simply be grateful. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you. I love you guys. Do you know that? I hope you really know that. Okay, let's stand and sing with joy. Lord, be glorified.
Father, I thank you for this seventh Sunday, the concluding Sunday of the season of Easter that we've been able to proclaim the wisdom of the Lord. And we just praise you that a life like a person named Peter and another one named Paul, whose lives are so radically changed that it's changed literally the world. So help us to become good students. Help us to remember that disciple means to be a learner and that all of us can learn and grow to the glory of Jesus Christ. Gracious Father, I pray for them as they search and wait patiently for a called pastor. In the interim time, I thank you for the privilege. We pray for our world and everything that's going wrong and death tries to tear everything else. And Father, it feels like Satan has his hand on everything, which he does, but he doesn't have the final word. So as faith people, help us to keep that focus so very important. Father, I will bring this whole conversation to you and prayerfully we can come home today or tomorrow from the hospital. I pray for Jake Nance, that you would just give him patience as the healing is simply take time. And we thank you for the success in his faith with you. Father, we now lift up as our first name. Okay. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all who can be put, trusting in your mercy and in your throne. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And after he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. For this is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me.
and again at the supper. He took the cup. Having given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it all of me. For this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Father, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and if it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Come taste and see that the Lord is good. Diane. I just told the nurse I've been vaccinated twice. I want to put the bread in your hand. He said, okay. Okay.
Now may the body and blood of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve the one of you unto eternal life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. 
Jesus Christ the Lord. He is in His creation, my Lord forevermore. From heaven He came and sought her to be His holy bride. With His own blood He bought her, and for her life He died. He let from every nation, yet one for all the earth. Her charter of salvation, one good, one faith, one good. Her holy name she blessed, her faithful holy good, and to our hope she blessed, with every grace in you. No real plus born for wonder, no world sees her oppressed, by sisters, <coughs> her sins distress. Yet saints there was forgiving their cries of hope how long. And soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. Through pollen, tribulation, and tumult of her war, she waits a consolation of peace forevermore. Filled with a vision glorious, her longing eyes are blessed. And the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. Yet she on earth hath union with a Lord three in one, and mystic sweet communion with those whose breath is one. Oh, happy ones and holy, Lord, give us grace that we, like in the meek and holy, My dear people, my peace I give unto thee, not as the world gives, give I unto thee. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Go in God's peace and serve your Lord. Thanks be to God. Counsel from me, please. Hey, go. And with you. It's good, though. Thank you. 